It was built to last 17 years, but the Red RM Routemaster bus is driving into its fourth decade. In today's modern climate, one of the major factors is cost. And this old baby will cost you a third of what one of these new vehicles would. We are a bus before the time, really. Uh, they're very, very built well, and they'll last another 30 years for the Routemaster. Like many examples of London architecture, it also has its critics. Well, of course, the Routemaster is probably a member of the oldest uh, working museum in the world now. The Routemaster has a very friendly face. The, the newer buses are terribly square and not very welcoming. But the Routemaster, you know, it, it comes along, it looks so friendly. And when you, you're getting on, there's somebody standing on the platform ready to welcome you. You go through a sort of lobby. Morning, Adam. Can I take a and then you go into the sitting area. And it's all like sort of being at home and very reassuring. Please hold tight now. The RM's got a very simple conventional layout. You've got the engine, two shock absorbers which are coiled, front axle, and then it runs through uh, the flywheel, fluid flywheel. Exhaust runs out and around and straight down the end of the bus. Prop shaft, gearbox, another prop shaft and then we come to the final bit the transmission the back axle on the right hand side which is a small back axle you can undo the bolts drop it down new one up finish not like uh, the new ones where you've got double reduction drives and christ knows what where you've got to pull off the bus apart to get at them that's about it really this bus is the last built to house an endangered species the conductor. Could you take a seat, sir, please? Go on as far as Oxford Circus. Traffic lights now, man, and be careful. This is traffic lights. Be very, very careful, please. Only Oxford Circus now. Be careful. We're all going on a summer holiday. No more working for a week or two. Fun and laughter on our... The Routemaster's predecessors made London's double-decker an institution. A mobile monument as familiar as Tower Bridge and Trafalgar Square, recognized across the world. In their heyday, when private cars were beyond most pockets, buses in London were cheap to ride on and profitable for their owners. The world's biggest urban passenger travel authority, London Transport. By its easily recognized visual characteristics, London Transport signposts the traveler and speeds him through this giant sprawl circle and crossbar on every bus stop and station. The bullseye symbol is there to reassure. Even a century ago, buses had the same layout of driver high up at the front and two floors for passengers linked by a spiral staircase at the back. Before World War I, buses were covering half a billion miles of London streets a year. In the 1920s, free enterprise flourished. Over 400 private operators touted for London passengers. Such unbridled competition was frowned upon, and an act of parliament in 1933 created London Transport. Its chief, Lord Ashfield, promised a properly coordinated system of passenger transport, avoiding wasteful and unnecessary competition. In 1933, the city had 40 different types of bus. London Transport wanted a single tailor-made model. After the war, the need for a new bus was all the more pressing. In October 1947, plans were drawn up. The Routemaster is a remarkable vehicle. It, uh, its uh, history goes back many, many years. It's really the ultimate development of the traditional London open platform bus. When the Routemaster was first developed in the 1950s, an amazing amount of time and effort was spent on um, producing a vehicle which in its day was staggeringly ahead of its time. A very advanced specification, which even today compares quite favorably with brand new vehicles. One of the engineers on the design team was Colin Curtis. 
it was decided that we should work on the principle of evolution and not revolution. In other words, we would utilize existing experience from previous models, experience of development work we had done and tested in service, so that we weren't creating a completely new and untried vehicle. It might have looked like its predecessors, but underneath it was a bus of the future, a schoolboy's dream come true. The world's most up-to-date bus will be the first to have power steering, hydraulic brakes, automatic gears, independent springs and fresh air heating for the passengers. Features unheard of even on most cars of the day. Since London Transport had been involved in assembling Handy Page Halifax aircraft during the war, a good deal of experience was drawn from this particular work in that body parts would all be interchangeable uh, on the bus. It could be put together and taken apart like a Meccano kit. Extensive use of aluminium saved weight. Carrying 64 passengers, eight more than its predecessor, the route master weighed the same. Materials new to buses, like fiberglass, were used for the bonnet and emergency back door. Every detail was considered. A cubby hole was made so the conductor could stand out of the way of passengers. And the cockpit was designed around the driver. Douglas Scott had designed everything from toasters to heaters to cookers. He was responsible for the route master's look, though some of his early designs were thought too radical. I think that any design comes off if attention is paid to every detail of it, uh, but the right attention. Scott even designed the seat fabric. You'll notice that the vertical stripe is a double bright yellow. Well, now, the idea of that was that when the, when the material was new, uh, the stripes were there and they could be seen as part of the design. As the material wore down, although the colours did fade, the brightness of the exposed cross uh, yellows kept the whole seat looking clean and wholesome to sit on and brightened the interior of the bus. The route master was designed in-house uh, by London Transport staff with a view to being an attractive piece of street furniture and at the same time serve the public of London. Building the first Routemaster prototype took three years, and there was another five years of testing before it went into full production. Nearly 100 people were involved in its development. Their attention to detail was more appropriate to a spaceship than a bus. <laughs> design has been approved, the bus is tested again. This time for six weeks at full speed, 200 miles a day over a special proving ground. Bumps and bends are there in abundance. And if in all conditions the bus behaves itself according to plan, it will at last be judged thoroughly fit for public service in London. The revolutionary design of the route master ensures that it is not only safer and easier to drive than the older buses, but also more comfortable to ride in. Demanding standards were set for new buses. The tilt test result delighted the designers. Oh, she passed that with flying colours. There was no problem whatsoever. Went way over the figure, and it pleased us no end. So in addition to day-to-day -day care in the garage, after three and a half to four years on the road, Every standard bus of the 8,000 in the world's largest unified bus fleet comes into the largest public service vehicle overhaul factory in the world, Alderman. A greater initial cost, but a more efficient and, in the long run, more economical way of carrying the load into the future. Convinced that their monopoly would last forever, London Transport had created a vast service centre in anticipation of expanding its fleet. First, it loses its identity. It's rotated like a toy on this inverter. Three and a half years' accumulation of oil-bound road dirt is pressure-hosed away. 
Everything must be progressing continuously towards the reassembly... The route master was built with Aldenham in mind. In the 50s, the labour shortage made attractive working conditions a high priority. A job to be done and a man to do it. Again, a principle in practice. First, bring him into a suitable space to perform his task. Next, provide him with every possible mobility. Offer him a fair incentive, and you can reasonably expect that everyone, the man, the works, the bus concern, and the public, will get the benefit of a good, fast job. At the time, our chairman wanted to advertise the bus, and on the prototypes, he put, this is the bus of the future. We thought we could do it quietly. We didn't want to make a big show of the thing, because we knew that something would go wrong. But the biggest problem was for crews, who had to adjust to the modern lightweight design. Well, it was a, a bit of a sensation. Uh, they only gave us an hour to uh, get used to it. And uh, on our first trip up into Crystal Palace, as we rounded the roundabout into the first stop, I found that the... Uh, so light on the front wheels that when I applied the brake, it skidded. And it frightened the life out of me, I must admit. Frightened the passengers waiting at the stop as well. I know when I was first in London and the route masters were all new. You know, we all knew that it had been specially designed for London and it was obviously so good for its work. We used to travel on those lovely long routes right, right across London. And you could look at, I mean, I always used to try and get the front seat on the top deck. And the 73 was absolutely super. We used to go from Oxford Circus to the Albert Hall for the uh, proms every year, uh, night after night. <laughs> It was 1959 before the RM went into full production. Over 2,700 were built during the 1960s. On the streets, they were a hit. Buses were travelling 20 million miles a year. It was a tribute to British craftsmanship. Suppliers were proud of their association with the route master. Everything's pip-pip and tickety-boo in San Francisco. For it's London week, don't you know? And a double-decker bus hobnobs with the cable cars. The Union Jack flies. But back home, the London bus had a competitor, the car. In the 50s, the car population in London had tripled, slowing traffic to speeds little faster than the horse bus era. But planners made the car's needs a priority. Revolutionary new measures are announced to cope with London's parking problem. And this is one of them, the two-hour parking meter. It's no good smiling sweetly at a police constable. These things are glamour-proof and quite infallible. And both the time and the charge can be adjusted, not of course by the motorist, according to local circumstances. In fact, the darn things just aren't human. Despite the publicity, by the mid-60s, London buses were losing five million pounds a year. When cuts were made, bus crews made their feelings known in the traditional British way. Here's a picture of 8,400 buses not being there, and that's quite something. For it's 21 years since London's buses were completely stopped by an official strike. So London walks to work. New economies meant revolutionary new designs which threatened the RM. London's always had double-decker buses with engine at the front and entrance at the rear. Now these conventional buses are being compared with a design that reverses the familiar pattern with engine at the rear, entrance at the front. The 72-seater Atlantean gives more passenger space. That's obviously an advantage. It was a radical new layout where the driver could collect the fares and make the conductor redundant. It's the driver who operates the front entrance door. At least one passenger was distinctly puzzled by the whole thing. London Transport bought time by stretching the RM three feet and adding eight more seats, but it was not enough. When we saw that one person operation was going to come in elsewhere, we did produce the rear engine route master, which was capable of one man operation 
and utilise 60% of the of common parts of the basic route master design. Curtis and his team swapped the route master around for one person operation, but it was too late. By the late 60s, London Transport were buying driver only buses off the peg. Plans were laid down for phasing out route masters and their conductors. see I'm an elderly party with a shopping trolley and a lot of my journeys are for shopping well the conductor gives lots of reassurance and some of them crack lovely jokes and, and give you a bit of enjoyment on your journey as well work wise I'm actually a fashion model based mainly in London and the buses for me are great for work great for getting around the good thing about the old buses is they've got no doors so you can hop on and off in between like the stops which you're not supposed to do, but it's great. Handy if you're in a rush to get to an appointment or a cast. Help for the people, you know, to be helpful and to help the old people and the women and children getting on the bus and to help her call out places of interest. Right now, this is John Lewis. Anybody want to stop John Lewis? We're going to this as far as we go now. But it's... They know all about London, they know it's putting you in the right direction, and um, just the friendly, you know, safer, especially for a woman. I think if there's a, a conductor on hand at all times. Peter Newman runs a fleet of driver-only sightseeing buses in London. Well, of course, the, the myth of the open platform um, is only strange to London. London Transport say that uh, they have to keep the route master on the streets of London because the open platform is popular. Well, of course, the open platform is popular. Lots of people get on and off between stops. The problem is the people that get on between stops don't pay. One person operation, uh, as far as a driver is concerned, is better too, because it allows him to talk to people and to see people. The engine's at the rear, so he has a much quieter uh, uh, environment, and of course he hasn't got that confounded bell going in his ear all day long. Because I do not like one-man operated buses. I just don't like them. My daughter works uh, 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 on them, and she says she likes them, but uh, in my opinion, and it's only my opinion, I don't think they're paid enough. That is one reason why I don't do it. Route masters were pensioned off to make way for the new models. Forty went to Sri Lanka. Through the 70s, London buses continued to lose money. Since the launch of the RM, Passenger journeys had halved. Huge cuts in routes and staff were called for. The bus of the future seemed to be the bus of the past. The grand design of the Alderham Service Centre had never fulfilled its promise. Progressively run down since it began, by 1986 it was closed. job to be done and a man to do it. A game of principle in practice. Offer him a fair incentive and you can reasonably expect that everyone, the man, the works, the bus concern and the public, will get the benefit of a good, fast job. When Britain wound the clock back, and open its bus routes to competition. The RM, that product of monopoly and nationalisation, found new supporters. 
The route master was designed for rapid boarding, rapid departure. And in a competitive environment, that is quite important. It means you can get to the bus stop in front of a conventional one-man operated bus and therefore uh, gain more custom. And anyway, the passengers like having a conductor who can talk to them, give them change, explain where the bus is going and so on and so forth. So the whole concept is very attractive from the passenger's point of view. The route masters uh, benefited from regular and excellent maintenance at Alderman and Chiswick Works in London. This meant that when we bought what on paper was a 20, 25 year old vehicle, in practice it was in the condition of a vehicle that was perhaps only five years old. And that's been a major factor in um, persuading operators to carry on running them out in the provinces. There is no way that we as a company, or I think the industry, could afford the development costs that went into this vehicle. You have to understand that those costs were spread over an order of 2,700 route masters. Today it's very unlikely that any operator or even a consortium of operators would buy in such large numbers. Over 300 of the redundant route masters were snapped up all over the country and painted in bright new colours. By the end of the 80s, London too was opened up to private operators. LT's monopoly was finished. Its garages now have to show a profit. But the old RMs have won a stay of execution. With conductors to take fares, they are faster than the opposition. The route master for London Transport is a very good bus to run. It was designed for them, designed by them, and designed for their use. And they can afford to run them. It's cost them millions and millions of pounds to run the route master over, over the years. And it's costing them millions of, well, thousands, or hundreds of thousands of pounds to run them now. There are very clear arguments about why they are much cheaper to maintain, why they're much cheaper to run, they use less fuel. And we believe that the route master costs no more to operate per mile than any other bus in the fleet. In the new competitive market, a bus in the garage isn't earning its keep, so ease of servicing is crucial. The whole design of the route master was with maintenance in mind such that any job that need to be done at a garage could be done in the space of a day. We are, the ideal was that the bus could run in the morning, come in, say, for an engine change during the middle of the day, and go out again the same evening. To take the engine out, we take off this front bar, which is held on by two bolts, front grille, two nuts, the complete wing comes off, two bolts under here, one bolt there, and we lift the whole the wing off, which makes everything accessible pull the engine out and it's finished. It's built up and back in within seven to eight hours. So everything on this vehicle is really built to do in under one day. Others are not so straightforward. We have to take off the boot lid, the center panel, the two outside corners, the bottom corners, the bottom bar, and you've got a framework inside there all still to be removed, untold pipe work, and then you can start to take the engine out so to do a complete engine change on one of these, we're talking two, two and a half days. Finding spares in the 90s for a bus built in the 60s requires ingenuity. With a route master, you cannot guarantee spares. Nobody can. And the only reason that people are able to keep them on the road is that they have to buy second-hand parts and they have to cannibalise existing vehicles to keep the remainder of the fleet going. Near the Grimethorpe Colliery in Yorkshire is Britain's biggest bus scrapyard. It's been like 20 years since I left school, from the age I've been like 15 like 35 now. What we bus dismantlers, what we do, it's like with the London Transport contract that we've got, we collect vehicles from London, we break them up, and we take the spares back down to London for them to reuse again. Well, the route master is a bus of its own, actually. I mean, it was a bus before its time, and it's a solid aluminium body, and it's really, really strong. That's why we have to use the mechanical grab to pull it apart.
Well, since, since we've had the contract, we've, we've broken the region of roundabout between 1,500 to about 2,000 route masters. Cannibalisation is not a good idea because it costs you a lot of money. Firstly, you have to have a guy who takes the parcels that you want. He has to know what he's taking off. Secondly, you've got to transport it down to wherever the other vehicle is. Then you've got to get another man to take the defective part off and put it uh, and replace it with a bit that you send down. You don't know whether the part you've taken off the other vehicle is good, is bad, indifferent. It might last a day, it might last a week. Everybody, I think, if they're honest about it, will say cannibalisation is the most expensive way of keeping any type of vehicle, let alone a Routemaster, on the road. Because it's been so well maintained through its life, the Routemaster even now is a very economical vehicle to operate. Uh, availability of spare parts is not a problem and uh, even now the condition of the vehicles is really first class. Uh, there is no reason why these Routemasters can't carry on operating in service for many years still to come. Whatever happens, the Routemaster will never be short of supporters. Because bus is the best way to see London. You know, from the upper deck you can see everything that goes on. You can even see things you can't see normally. And it's absolutely super. It's very sad. These keep the traffic flowing much better than that. It would be very sad to see them go, actually. You know? And I suppose they call it progress. To me, it's not progress. The Route Master is the last of the line, if you like, that was designed to a specification by London Transport and current vehicles are much more to a manufacturer's standard. It is said that they cost perhaps 50% more than any other regular bus to buy when they were new. Uh, but, of course, taking a 30-year view, that money has been handsomely repaid. Today's modern buses are off the peg. This vehicle was designed and built to work London, and it survived for 30 years, and hopefully it'll survive for another 30. Top Gear's back in half an hour here on BBC Two. The latest models on test, the biker who skis on tarmac, and the Bentley Continental R.